We're going to get started. Uh, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Um, uh, CSIS has been doing this work on harnessing the data revolution to achieve the sustainable development goals in partnership with the JICA Research Institute. Um, the subtitle is Enabling Frogs to Leap. Um, you know, I have to say, uh, when I was first presented with this topic, I thought, what the hell is this thing? I mean, statistics and, I mean, I was just like, I, but, and then I read the papers and I still didn't fully get it. I, under, I knew it, they were onto something. And then we went to a couple of countries and then I understood. And I understood why this is important. And all of you understood it bef you know, before reading the report, but I hope, we hope the report will help build on some of the work that's been done by others about, about this topic. But for to have a functioning society, you need credible and relevant and timely information. And one of the other things that was struck me in the conversations we had, we must, I, I participate, I went to Laos and Myanmar. Myanmar is a recent democracy. And so the woman who is the chief statistical officer of the country said, you know, I was the statistical officer of the country before it was a democracy. And I'm the statistical officer now that it's a democracy. And let me tell you something, in a democracy, you get a lot more demands for timely data. And so it's really interesting that there was sort of this interesting dynamic between a democracy and openness and data and it's kind of a virtuous circle. And so she's getting more asks for even more data because of this openness, very interesting. Um, we've got a, a lot of goals that the world has made um, about uh, trying to make the world a better, safer, healthier place over the next 15 years. The folks who did some thinking about that, including folks like Claire Melamed and uh, Homi Karas and others said, you know, we're gonna have to kind of track this stuff and see how we're doing and we actually don't have the right tools for this. And so that's what prompted this conversation. So um, I think we're gonna be able to unpack a lot. We've got some really smart and thoughtful people here to help us with this. Um, what we're gonna do first is, uh, I'm gonna, you're gonna hear, hear first from my very good friend, Dr. Katano, who's the di director of the JICA Research Institute. Then Dr. Katano and I are gonna have a brief armchair conversation, then we're gonna go to a panel discussion, um, and we've got some really great people. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor over to my very good friend, Dr. Katano. Dr. Katano, please come on up. Thanks, my friend, thank you. So thank you, Dan, and thank you all for joining uh, us today. My name is now Hiro Kitano, Director of JICA Research Institute. Our JICA Research Institute is a research wing of Japanese aid agency, JICA, we equivalent to USAID, and we provide a platform for uh, evidence-based and operational-oriented uh, research activities on international development. So today I will share some of the highlights from our joint CSIS and JICA Research Institute report harnessing the data revolution to achieve the sustainable development goals in enabling frogs to live. So this report was the result of a year of collaboration between our two institutes. So it comes at the time when both the United States and Japan have embraced the power of technology and innovation in their international development agenda. So it also comes as data takes a more prominent position in development practice. Uh, first, let me touch upon the context of this report. The SDGs adopted in September 2015 has 17 goals and more than 230 associated indicators. The data become ever so important to help governments achieve and to monitor the progress of SDGs. So before launching SDGs, the UN convened a high-level panel of eminent persons on the post-2015 development agenda. So the panel called for a data revolution and recommended the formation of an independent body to lead the charge. So this recommendation resulted in the creation of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, GPSDD, in 2015, led by Korea Mermaid, an open multi-stakeholder network working to harness the data revolution for sustainable development. 
This report defines the data revolution as an unprecedented increase in the volume and types of data and the subsequent demand for them. This revolution is allowing governments, companies, researchers, and citizens to monitor progress and drive action, often with real-time, dynamic, disaggregated data. While we will conclude on a positive note, I think it's important to acknowledge some of the core challenges upfront for developing, developing country governments, such as addressing capacity constraints at all levels, uh, so you can keep those in mind throughout my presentation. Thankfully, developing country governments are not alone. While funding has not increased to the necessary extent, the international community has embraced its post-MDG role in the data revolution. Here, coordination among stakeholders is critical. The SDGs address issues in a cross-cutting, interconnected way. This more collaborative approach raised significant data collection, utilization, and sharing questions. The SDG commitment to the concept of no one left behind also presented a challenge as disaggregated data by income, gender, age, ethnicity, and other characteristics is often unavailable. The UN recognized that there had been an explosion in the amount of data collected globally, and there had been a corresponding growth in demand from private, public, and social sector entities. So this simultaneous top-down and bottom-up interest in harnessing the data revolution created a unique opportunity for transformative change. So new data capture technologies have fundamentally changed the way we collect, analyze, and manage data. Some of innovations include satellite technology, wearable technology, cellular technology, and mobile banking, and mobile and smart card technology. This report analyzes the challenges and opportunities that ex exist in the pursuit of the data revolution. It considers the challenges faced by two developing countries, Laos and Myanmar, in the broader context of what will be needed to enable deep flow data technologies to take hold and ultimately drive the data revolution without following the linear progression of development laid out by OECD countries. To achieve this outcome, the developing countries will need to build domestic institutional capacity to use and maintain new technologies. In order to bring about the deep flow in developing countries, we identified three stages mentioned in this slide. So from here on, I would like to introduce some examples of the development projects using deep flow data technologies. The first project is the Vientiane Bus Project in Laos, funded by JICA. Uh, this is a good example of a deep frog development using existing smartphone technologies and small data. As it is shown in the photo, smartphones are installed on the city buses, and the GPS on these smartphones sends bus information to the central control room. So data such as the bus traffic operation status and the bus traveling speed is used for the efficient bus operation. Moreover, the data also contribute to Vientiane urban traffic management. These data are also shared with the citizens and helps to improve convenience of the bus services. The next one is a project on reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, which uses satellite technology to monitor deforestation and create a database of forests in Laos. Its goal is to address the underlying causes and drivers of deforestation, 
with cooperation in Laos. The fo this photo shows that ja JICA experts are working together with their counterparts using the forestry monitoring system. Through this on-the-job training, the counterparts will build up their capacities to use satellite information to identify the deforestation area. Third example is a project for development of a comprehensive disaster resilience system and collaboration platform in Myanmar. This project involving researchers from the University of Tokyo and the Yangon Institute of Technology monitors challenge changes in the ground and urban environment associated with the development process and develops uh, scenario analysis systems for assessing vulnerabilities to potential disasters in Myanmar. The system would include flood modeling and prevention, infra infrastructure cataloging, and traffic management, and will present several opportunities for improving Myanmar's data collection and the utilization in public policy planning. In addition to the field visit to Laos and Myanmar, the report contains a number of relevant case studies in fields such as agriculture, health, personal ID system, and ICT. One eminent case for ICT capacity building is an ICT program in Kigali, Rwanda. ICT is central to Rwanda's vision for 2020. In order to support Rwanda's national ICT strategies, JICA has sent a Japanese ICT expert, Mr. Nakayama, to Kigali in 2009. He supported the Rwandan side to establish ICT Chamber of Commerce and K-Lab, a kind of innovation hub, which has served as a platform for capacity building to grow ICT industries in Rwanda. Students and entrepreneurs would come to KRAB to work on their ideas or projects and turn them into viable business models. At the same time, a graduate scholarship program, the African Business Education Initiative for Youth, ABE Initiative, has provided opportunities for young and talented Rwandans to study ICT at Kobe Institute of Computing in Japan. Based on our research interviews and uh, site visit, CSIS and JAC Research Institute propose six recommendations for international community, such as do not fixate on big data. Small data is good as well. Capacity building is the key, and sharing good practices. So data revolution deep frog data technology, and the international community will be the keywords for today's discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Catano, thank you very much. Thanks for your partnership with us. Um, could you talk a little bit about why Japan was interested in working on a data revolution? Yeah. So in the first year of our collaboration with CSIS, we picked up two topics, innovation ecosystem and smart cities. And for the year two, we wanted to continue to pursue the theme of transformative innovation for international development, so we chose to focus on data revolution and SDGs following the UN adoption of SDGs in September 2015, as I have mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so I think that it was very timely to pick up this topic. Uh, and as for JICA, we have been working on a number of projects using data technologies, some of which were featured in the report. You know, I, when I think about the conversations we've had over the last year, one of the things I, I take away is that you have a series of countries in the Asia Pacific region that are becoming middle income countries. Uh, Japan has a long term partnership mindset with its partner countries. You have a number of Japanese technology companies, not just JAXA, which is the Japanese version of NASA, 
having to do with satellites, but also sensor technologies or other sorts of electronics that are proliferating. And so Japan, Japanese companies are also playing a role. So you have developing countries that are moving up the curve who don't necessarily need, necessarily need basic human needs, but instead need other things. They have a long-term partnership with you. Japan has technology. And Japan's JICA is very well known for its uh, capacity building. And so as a result of that, th it seems to me this is a very appropriate topic for Japan to be working on. Um, the, we talked about in the report about leapfrog technologies. And we've been having a conversation today about leapfrog technologies. Could you talk a little bit about um, leapfrog technology, a, a leapfrog technology or two that, in your mind, uh, you know, speaks to this, to this phenomenon? Are there some things that you think are particularly interesting as, yeah. as technologies? Thank you. So in our report, the leapfrog data technologies are defined as products, ideas, or refinements that have impact potential in the developing country context. So in Vientiane, Laos, so I have explained one example. And uh, there is another example, JICA project, uh, uh, which is uh, focused on improving the bus operation system by monitoring continuous traffic volume and uh, speed observation through smartphone Wi-Fi packet sensor uh, at the uh, junctions. So this is also a good example of leapfrog development using the existing sensor technologies and not the big data, but small data. By collecting and analyzing this information, the bus uh, company can carry out uh, its operational management more effectively and provide feedback on the route plan. And it is also possible that this information could be used for the urban transportation planning. Good. I think, uh, Dr. Katana, one of the other things um, that I've taken away from this conversation is that we've published this report. I'm looking forward to going to Tokyo next week. How, is, how are you going to convince your colleagues in JICA to do something about this? Because it seems to me there's, over the last several years, there's been several papers and several things done to sort of say, hey, there needs to be some things done about this. So how, how do you imagine JICA doing something yeah. about all yeah. this? So the international community, including private sectors or NGOs and agencies like JICA, is expected to support developing countries to create an enabling environment for the leapfrog. And JICA's new mission statement uh, uh, announced this year also states innovation as one of our core actions. So we aim to innovate to bring about unprecedented um, impact to the developing world. So JICA's strength as an aid agency is, uh, as you have uh, rightly mentioned, yeah. that it's long experience of capacity building. So we'll continue to work together with developing country, uh, you know, institutions and people to build their technical capacity. So, 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 you know, that way I think the, we could share the importance of the topic with our colleagues in, in JICA. What, what, I, what also struck me in the conversation we were having earlier is that your prime minister is leading a, an SDG process. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think, that, I think the way in which Japan is going to engage on the big data conversation is related to the SDG conversation. Yeah. The, the data issue or data revolution and the SDGs uh, is indispensable. Uh, and uh, uh, the Japanese government established the SDG promotion headquarter uh, uh, the right before the uh, G, uh, G7 summit. Uh, in Japan. In Japan, yeah, in, in Japan. And uh, uh, the, led by the Prime Minister Abe. And uh, uh, the Japanese government already announced the- I, I'm sure he's called President Trump and asked him to do the same thing. <laughs> right. And uh, already we had you know, guidelines. And also recently uh, in New York, the, uh, we participate the uh, high level political forum. And uh, we the Japanese government uh, participated the uh, voluntary uh, forum to present our uh, principles or guidelines of SDGs. And uh, uh, even we have announced uh, to establish the award for private companies uh, for the sake of promotion of SDGs. And also recent, just quite recently, 
the uh, Japanese government also announced to uh, the, the provide the, uh, the special fund for local government promoting SDGs within Japan. Well, I'm hoping Fujitsu wins it uh, next year. I mean, but it's, it's, a, um, it's quite clear that Japan has taken the SDG process quite seriously. And so it fits, it would be logical for Japan's aid agency to accompany that process through supporting yeah. data and statistical yes. information. It is, and you also have many partnerships with the statistical agencies or have relationships with the statistical aid, government statistical agencies of many of your partner countries, especially in Asia, for yes. example, right? In the case of Cambodia, we have been supporting Cambodia Statistical Department uh, for a long time, over 10 years, for the, uh, strengthening the, its uh, capacities uh, by providing technical cooperation. And so that kind of long-term commitment is very important. Uh, I'll tell you, it's just you, when Japan is a friend to somebody, you know that they're a reliable friend and they're a long-term friend. And so I know what was really interesting to me when I went to Myanmar was we got meetings that as an American citizen or if I had worked through the American government, I don't think we'd have gotten at CSIS. But because we were going with Japan, we got all sorts of meetings we weren't going to get otherwise. And so Japan had, takes a very long-term view, and, and JICA takes a long-term view to its relationships. Thank you. So, the okay. So I've got. Um, I just would you just talk? I think we need to spend a minute about the issue of small data. We had a discussion in our podcast interview about what is small data, uh, but I think it's relevant to this question about a data revolution and big data and what is small data. You had a. You had your interpretation of small data. I'll share mine in a second, but I'd be curious about what, when I say the term small data, because we talk about it in the recommendations, don't just think about big data, think about small data. When you, when you hear that term, what, what comes to mind for you? Okay, as I have just uh, introduced yeah. two cases uh, in the case of you know, a bus operation system in Laos, yeah. uh, the, the data, the volume of data uh, the bus company uh, have utilizing it's not a big data, it's a kind of small scale data. So the data storage uh, is uh, not very big. It's a, it's a step up from Excel spreadsheets. Yes. And uh, uh, I don't know how else small. to say it. You yeah. know. <laughs> I'm but, not a tech person. Yeah. So the, but the, it works really, you know, well. And uh, so by fully utilizing small scale data, uh, we can, you know, uh, the achieve uh, many things. Right, I mean, so, if, so when I, we went to the bus station, I mean, it's a Vian Shan bus, municipal bus offices are what you would imagine the Vian Shan municipal bus offices to look like. But they've got a long-term partnership with Japan. And so now if you have an app, you can see what time the bus is coming at the corner of 16th and H in Vian Shan, and you can track it. And so it's, it's not gobs and gobs of data. That's not the technical term. I don't know, terabytes or whatever it is. But it's not gobs and gobs, and it's not Excel spreadsheet level. But it's that kind of information is enough for someone to, you know, to run a more effective city, but also make decisions as the city manager of the bus system to say, well, I need an additional bus on this route or this sort of a thing. All, you know, and you, can, you, you apply that across a city, or you apply that across a country, and that's a very logical thing to do. So, so, Dr. Gatano, I agree with you that that is one way to think about small data. I would posit the small data, one, another way to think about small data, because I think if you say the term big data, I think it has different meanings to different people. I went to six government leaders in one of the Southeast Asian countries. I said, you know what big data is? None of them knew what it was. Now, maybe it's like an American idiomatic term, or it's sort of a salesy thing that tech companies use to sell their black boxes and widgets and stuff and whatever, um, or Japanese companies for that matter. And so that's great. So they didn't know what it was. But the one woman who was at sort of a UN kind of, I don't know how to describe it, sort of like an aggregator of people to talk to each other about data in one of these countries said, look, everyone comes through, someone comes through here once a month talking about big data. Uh, I would posit, this woman said to me, I would posit it's really about small data. And what she meant by small data, and what stuck with me was, okay, I need, uh, when I walk, so when I walked in with some of these statistical agencies, I walked into one, there was a big open room, and there were 30 people at 19th century desks with paper, 
six feet high. There was one computer for 30 people. It was unclear. It was unclear if the, the statistical agency people were literate. It was unclear if the statistical agency folks were numerate. Uh, so one diplomat told me that it was unclear whether or not, so, not saying which country, but there was a, that specifically that there was issues about whether some folks could not actually compute an, a, 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 an average, use, you know, to, and that in some instances, uh, electricity was spotty, access to the internet spotty. So having all those sorts of things were necessary, were kind of necessary assumptions to sort of our conversation about big data. Now, I think Claire Melamed in her comments later will say, we can't just wait until we kind of get all those folks, I'm not, I don't want to put words in Claire's mouth, but I just say that we can't wait until all those sorts of components are fixed, because that's going to take a long time. But we need to work on that too. If we want to fully achieve the data revolution, we need to leverage these new technologies and these new pools or existing pools of data and use them in new ways. But in order to fully take advantage of it, we need to continue to do the sorts of less glamorous. It's this stuff, that kind of stuff ain't glamorous. There's not whiz-bang technology companies involved. It doesn't have buzzwordy stuff to it. And it's kind of the continuing toiling in the labors that you know, various people who've worked on statistical strengthening have been doing for, I don't know, 20, 30, or 40 years. There are people here probably in this room who've been working on statistical strengthening for 40 years. Bef you know, and the term big data, or the data revolution term came around three or four years ago, and they said, it's great. Welcome to my world. I've been here for 30 years. I'm so glad you're here. Right? I'm just guessing that there are probably some people in the audience who are like that. So, so I think we got to do both. We can't be all big data, and we can't just all be about taking all those stacks of paper, making sure all those folks' capacities are higher, and we have electricity in the, and in the internet, but we need some of that as well. So. We need a little bit of both. That, that was my, that's my big takeaway from this exercise. The final point is I want to come back to what I said earlier about um, democracy. I was so taken uh, by this conversation with a woman who's the head of the statistical agency. She was really one of the most interesting people I've met in development. Very impressive, charismatic, and just this whole issue of transparency, democracy, and sort of a democracy. You know, so in Myanmar, the junta lied about economic growth. They said every year they had 10% growth for years. That's a lie. They lied. Uh, they m purposely undercounted their Muslim population. I, I hope they're not anymore. Uh, they did a whole bunch of things that they shouldn't have done, but now they're not. And so it's very interesting about technology and transparency and what that means in terms of also asking for more account, using, U I'll use UN speak here, more accountable governance for more accountable governance, that it's important for more accountable governance and being accountable to a citizenry. So that's also, I think, an important dimension to this conversation that sometimes is missed. But that was one of my takeaways from my visit to Myanmar whenever it was six months ago. So look, Dr. Katao, thanks for your partnership. Yeah. I'm very grateful. You're my friend and my colleague. I think this is an important report. I hope everybody here reads this report. I know if you have trouble sleeping at night, you know, read, no. <laughs> no, I think it's actually going to be more important than that. But I think it's, it's an important contribution, and I'm grateful for the partnership that, that we did together. And now we're going to put the panel together. Now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, much. my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. How's this? Now we're going to do a scene change, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm sure if I'm supposed to tell jokes while we're waiting for this or, or not. Just give us a minute.
some really smart people. I'm really happy to have Claire Melamed, who I think has been a, is really a really interesting person in international development, but has also been a leader on issues around data, and I think has been entrusted with a very important role in her role as executive director of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. Can you, okay, so Claire, how did you end up in this job? Because I think there's a, there's a, there's a pre-story to your current life that's related to this conversation. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for those very kind words. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a real pleasure to be here because of this excellent report that Thank yourself you. and, and Dr. Kitano and others have, have shepherded through. I think it's a really good, great contribution. Um, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, as the name suggests, was born very much from the process that created the Sustainable Development Goals. And it came out of the thinking which Dr. Kitano has outlined, the understanding that not only was it, on the one side, it was not possible to create, to, to achieve the SDGs without better data, but luckily, we also now are in, live in a world where there are many sources of great data available to us at much more volume, much more speed than we've seen before. So it's, the Global Partnership exists to put together these two, see, these two insights and really harness, foster the kinds of new things along with all of the old business of capacity building that Dan's very rightly said is absolutely essential and put them at the service of the Sustainable Development Goals. That's the, that's the short version. I won't go into the long version because that will take up the time of all of my fellow panelists. But um, really for me, it's come through partly harnessing the political process of the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals and really the, the, the insights of parts of the United Nations and a group of, of countries, of civil society organizations, of companies, not least my very good friend there, um, Paul Zeitz, when he was uh, working in the State Department, who really led the charge to, to create this new institution. It's not easy to create a new thing. And to have the sort of vision, I think, and the conviction that that was what was needed and make it happen in an incredibly short time, I think is something for which, which we should all, not least myself in my new job, be very grateful. I think for me personally, just one more anecdote about the process of creating the Sustainable Development Goals. I had a very immediate experience during that process of the importance of data and of harnessing some new, putting new and old data sources together to really influence outcomes for the better. I mean, we, we heard just, just now about the importance of accountability, accountable governance and so on, where there is now in the SDGs a goal on accountable governance. And we have SDG 16 on, um, on good governance, which was hard fought. One of the reasons why we have that goal is because of a huge global survey called the My World Survey, in which 10 million people were asked what was the thing that they most cared about. And a very large number of them said, good governance, among others. It was a survey that was actually born in Tokyo. I, my, myself, with, with another colleague, dreamt up the idea in a, uh, in a bar in, in Tokyo on the fringes of, a, of an early meeting um, about the SDGs. But it was the power of that data, that data from those 10 million people, that was part of convincing the governments as they sat together in the UN to negotiate the Sustainable Development Goals that a goal, goal 16, the goal on governance was something that they had to put in and that there would be, it was not acceptable to the population of the world to leave that out. So I think for me that was an early example mm. of the power of data in achieving change and one of the many reasons why I'm so proud to do the job that I do. It's great. So I, mean, I think one of the things to take away is that this isn't just about collecting numbers and information, that the numbers and information spur change and spur action and track Progress. So let me just ask Claire, how are we doing on progress on the SDGs? And are we, do we have enough data? Do we have enough data to track this stuff? Can we ben are we benchmarking? Are we in a good place in terms of benchmarking and in terms of progress? We don't have enough data to measure the SDGs. And what's interesting about this is unlike some of the other development problems that we place, we're really all in the same boat when it comes to data on the SDGs. There's no country in the world that has enough data to monitor to adequately monitor their progress across all of the indicators of the SDGs. And I think it really gives everybody a vested interest and a common interest 
in using all of the resources at our disposal to improve the data that we have. It's not a straightforward north-south development agenda, mm -hmm. you know, the richer countries showing the poor countries the way and telling them what to do. It's very much a collective endeavor of all countries trying to do something which some, you know, no countries have done before. Okay, so just two last things. I'm so happy you're here, and you can tell I, I really like speaking with Claire. It was really great having her at this pregame lunch. And okay, so what is the homework assignment if you're an aid agency? If you're the head of the JICA aid agency, or Mark Green was here, the head of USAID, or the head of the Asian Development Bank, what is their homework assignment in this conversation? I think there are two things which are connected and lead to a third thing. So one thing is resources. You know, I think data has always been the poor relation in development spending. We don't give enough resources to data as a thing in itself. And likewise, we don't give enough resources in thinking about data as an essential component of programs that aid agencies run all the time. So if you're running a health program, if you're running an education program, it's still relevant to think about what investment are you making in improving the data in that country on education or on health or whatever the thing is. So I think there's a resource question. I also think there is a, a sort of innovative relationships question, and this is not obviously just the business of donors, it's also critically the business of, of governments and of, of other partner governments and of the private sector. But I think we all have an interest in understanding how to do things differently, because unlike some of our traditional development uh, problems, data is not only a problem of resources. You can't fix data only with money. You also need technology. You also need good relationships between the public and the private sector mm -hmm. to create the kind of partnerships that are actually at the heart of this. So I think the onus is then on all of the actors in the development space to think about innovative ways of bringing that about. It's partly resources, it's partly partnerships. And the third thing, I think, is about scale. I think we were talking about this earlier over lunch. We've got a little bit trapped in pilot land in the development sector, in the data sector in particular, perhaps that applies more generally to development. There are a lot of And really I was saying that CSIS is available for pilots, so <laughs> someone wants to fund us doing pilots, we're available for that. But if somebody wants to fund us to take them to scale, we're available yeah, for that Yeah, you guys, too. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, but um, you know, I think there are lots of pilots going on. People are really excited by this, you know, and people are innovating, and that's fantastic, and it's really inspiring to me every day to hear about all of the things that are going on in this world and all of the better ways that people are coming up with to do things. You know, big companies, small country, small companies, little grassroots organizations everywhere, you know, getting together with people to do new things, and it's amazing. But I think we've become trapped at that level. Our response to every question is to do another pilot, and I think at some point, I hope very soon, we'll, be, we'll become braver and more confident in being able to say, look, we know we don't have all the answers, but there are some things that we know work well enough to invest in scale, because it's through scale that you get change. Okay, so last question. Thanks for uh, bearing with me. Okay, so Facebook, Google, Cloudera, could be Fujitsu, NEC, there's a whole universe of technology companies that have something to do with this conversation. So what, how, what is, what's their role in all this? I think they have very, very different roles. And I think one of the big differences is between companies who produce data, so your Google and your Facebook, and mobile phone companies and others who have a very important role in supplying data, but also who have an interest potentially in, in using that data for their own commercial ends, in marketing that, in, mar you know, in monetizing that data. So I think there's a difficult relationship there and we have to think about that. There's obviously also a huge role. We sometimes get fixated on the, the sort of volumes of data and they're pretty impressive, but there are huge things that have to happen at either side of that. There's no, you know, without, you can't collect that data without the, technical, the technology infrastructure, the wires and the masks and all of that. There's a private sector interest there. You can't actually, even if you were handed that data, you can't use it without the computing power, without the data, the, the data science expertise that will give you the, tell you how to run the algorithms that give you the answers. The data isn't the answer. The answer is what happens when you put the algorithm into the data and get the answer out. So I think there's a, depending on the type of company, there is, you know, there are a million different ways that companies need to engage. But I think the critical thing, of course, as with anything, is that 
they have to want to, and companies have to see both the social interest in being part of the project of achieving the sustainable development goals worldwide, and those of us who want to engage the private sector onto that have to be, I think, much better, and I include the global partnership in this, at demonstrate, pr presenting a compelling value proposition to companies as to why there are always going to be a few individuals and companies who p want to do it for the social good and they are the vanguard and we should all be happy with that. But we also need to, to re engage with the others and give them a compelling value proposition that explains why this is a good thing, not just for us, not just for the planet, but for those companies as well. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Kenichi Kanya, thanks for being here. You're the Senior Director of SDG's Mainstreaming Team uh, at JICA. Um, not a small task, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, so we were talking earlier with Dr. Kitano about the seriousness by which Japan is taking the sustainable development goals. Can you talk about how, what you're doing day to day in terms of your day job as it relates to SDG mainstreaming? Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I think it's on. My name is I'm in charge of SDGs in Japan. I take the microphone off my back for you. How's that? I'd like to share uh, some experiences, our experiences in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'd like to use. Uh, ah. Uh, Oh, and SDGs are very challenging, and SDGs need innovation or reprog or uh, data revolution. And uh, uh, we know that, uh, we, JICA knows that uh, SDGs are quite challenging. And SDGs changed JICA. We are a government organization, and we are a little bit uh, bureaucratic organization. However, we changed our mind. We agreed that we must be innovative to achieve SDGs. Last week, we had a meeting uh, together with all the country directors, and uh, we shared this, our strategies. The and third one is uh, mentioning uh, innovation and collaboration. For innovation, it's very important. Uh, we will focus on it. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to share three projects. Uh, first one is reducing <coughs> infant and fetus mortality rate in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Uh, we utilized uh, our experiences, Japanese experiences. Uh, this is uh, the photo of Kagawa Prefecture. Uh, there, are, there are many islands in this prefecture. Uh, there are many remote areas there. And uh, there is not so many hospitals or doctors in the island or mountainous area. So there, mothers cannot visit hospitals frequently. <coughs> and doctors asked mothers to use very small equipment uh, in this slide. You see uh, on the top of the stomach. Uh, and uh, uh, this equipment monitor infant or fetus heart rate. Uh, it seems that uh, they could not get appropriate medical checkup at the site. Uh, however, uh, the data enabled real time monitoring of infants or fetus through internet. Uh, doctors can easily identify high risk group. Uh, as a result, now Kaga Prefecture uh, scores the lowest infant mortality rate in Japan. Uh, the best scores in Japan means uh, best score in the world. And we have the worst one, it looks like. <laughs> no, no, no. That's uh, so good. <laughs> and they got over the lack of infrastructure or doctors and realized leapfrog with data. Uh, Based on the experience, uh, the prefecture supported Thailand for three years. Uh, the project was awarded by 
government of Thailand today, I heard, uh, as an innovative project in Thailand Public Service Award 2017. And uh, the project implies us that uh, data helps to get over lack of infrastructure or human resources and realize the leapfrog. Uh, in this case, the project uh, offered better care, better service for mothers and infants than that of urbanized area. The second one is already um, Dr. Kitano explained uh, this last project in Laos. So I'd like to make one additional comment on that project. Uh, for SDGs, people play uh, critical roles. So we have to deal with or change people's perception and behavior. For example, reducing food loss. Uh, left some, something left behind in your refrigerator or reducing papers for office meetings or losing weight to reduce non-communicable diseases such as diabetes. Data can help such challenges. Uh, personally, I recently I made a line chart uh, of my weight every day and I lost my weight around 10 kilograms for three months. Mm. <laughs> and it's great to tussle. This is like a support group. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> uh, I would like to ask data professionals to change people's behavior by data. Uh, uh, like this. And the uh, last one is uh, about uh, insurance, uh, weather index insurance. As you may know, SDG industry matrix uh, refers this project as a good example. Uh, we collaborated with Japanese insurance company, uh, Sonpo Japan uh, Holdings, and offered insurance for small rice farmers. Uh, the insurance alleviates losses when their crops are damaged by drought. It is based on temperature and rainfall data, uh, as seen in this slide. Uh, uh, it's based on temperature and rainfall data from Japanese satellite and uh, U.S. satellites also. It covers uh, Thailand, Myanmar, and Indonesia. Farmers can quickly receive the insurance with only the information of temperature and rainfall in case of drought. Uh, they, uh, the company or uh, farmers, do not need complicated, complicated investigations to identify damage and reasons. The farmers passed such investigations and they could utilize Japanese satellite data for themselves. That is one of refrog, I think. And uh, uh, this project shows that we should pay attention to new data, such as satellite data, and uh, to go into partnership with a uh, uh, data holder. Uh, that data is uh, uh, held by uh, JAXA, uh, Dan explained before. And uh, however, uh, we should focus on more important thing. Uh, starting from issues is quite important. Uh, issues means objectives, SDG goals, or targets, or people left behind. In this case, how to help farmers from drought was a big drive or motivation for the company to find good data. And they finally found the data from JAXA. And in other case, we can start from children, refugees, or handicapped people. We need both approach, uh, starting from SDGs or goals, and starting from data or methodologies or means, uh, both approach we need. Otherwise, we might not be able to cover uh, some of the SDG goals. We cannot cover all the SDG goals, and we might not be able to achieve no one left behind in SDGs. That is what I want to emphasize. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's clear that um, we can apply data to a whole series of challenges uh, and that it's not, it's not just about statistical agencies, it's about using data across a whole series of global challenges 
to get better outcomes. So thank you very much for that. Um, great. Um, Mr. Atal, you're the head of digital services and head of business and application services for Fujitsu Americas. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, I was particularly interested in how Fujitsu is thinking about two things. How are you thinking about international development broadly, or how does it come across the radar screen of your company at Fujitsu? And then to the extent that in emerging markets where you're, you're working with governments where perhaps the capacity is lower, how do you ensure that countries fully make full use of the technologies and services that Fujitsu offers? Thank you. So <clears throat> first, uh, thank you for inviting uh, me. Thank you for inviting Fujitsu. So I, together with Cloudera, I think I, I represent uh, the business here. Um, and congratulations for the report. Thank I read you. it and I didn't fall asleep. So you get, you mm -hmm. get a credit for having read the report. Thank you. There'll yeah. be a quiz yeah. afterwards, yeah. but thank you very much. And thanks for, uh, I just want to mention, I come from New York and uh, it's an important day for everybody in the yes. US. So thanks for uh, having me in Washington. I was in New York uh, 16 years ago, so it's uh, emotional to be in the capital yes. of the US. Uh, just yeah. before answering your question, uh, Fujitsu is not just a Japanese company, it's a global company. We have about uh, 155,000 employees. We operate in 100 countries, including Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, Caribbean, um, everywhere in the world. Um, it's very important for us to partner with institutions like yours, uh, uh, because I, I read your World Data Revolution, and uh, you mentioning the buzzword that company are using for marketing. We are very good at creating those buzzwords. Mm. And now we're talking about digital uh, revolution after in the past there was uh, e-commerce and prior to that uh, cloud server, mainframe. We always announce a new revolution. This is a real one. Two years ago, my boss used to say this, is, this digital revolution and the data revolution is as important as the uh, creation of the printing by Gutenberg mm. a few decades ago. And now he's changing his speech. He said, no, it's more important, it's as important as when people used to communicate to each other. And I will give you some, uh, some data points. Because uh, digital doesn't mean anything. I mean, the IT business for 33 years, always been digital, it's just one and zero. Uh, but there is two massive change in, in, in the technology that are driving what you just described. One is the reduction of the size and the price of a microprocessor. 70 years ago, there was only one computer in the US that was for the military. After that, we moved to mainframes that company enterprise could buy. And then we called, uh, if you remember, digital equipment created a distributed computer. So we could have computer in more than one per, in, per companies. And then IBM came with the PC or others with the PC. Now we all have this. You know, there is more power in this smartphone than in the computer that launched the man in the moon. Um, every one of us have a, a computer like this. And so you think 70 years ago, and it's accelerating. So think about 10, 20 years ahead of time, we will have something way more powerful than this. I don't know what it is, but now we are talking about putting microchips in your bodies. You know, there is a lot of healthcare solution where the sensors are embedded in your body. Google is looking at developing system to put in your brain so that you won't have to go through this interface anymore. You just have to think, and the google.com uh, will come directly to your brain. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is hyperconnectivity. Everybody's connected. And so to your point, it's more than the data revolution. It's about collecting data and accessing data. And then technology company like ours, we are investing billions of dollars in tools and software to take advantage of those data, I think to your point. It's not just about we collecting, and, and the interesting thing, you are the one producing the data. So it's not enterprise, it's not Google, it's not Fujitsu, it's not the government. You are the one producing the data. The, because everything you do on this uh, smartphone or everything you're gonna do when you will have a microchip in your body will be collected by somebody. And uh, then the name of the game for technology is what do we do with the data? And that's all the technology, cloud, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all those tools and those uh, software platforms that 
companies are developing to take advantage of those data for the good of the, of, of the world. So the Fujitsu way and the reason we are uh, associated to organizations like ours, yours or JICA is that we think the technology revolution has to be centered on the human being. So our tagline, if you go into the, our website, is human-centric intelligent society. How do we create a human-centric intelligent society? We used to deliver or invest for enterprise. And then when the computer became more accessible, we invested for users in enterprise and then for consumer. Now we have to invest for human because the power is in the human. And um, I'm going to give you two other data points. Every 15 months, the world doubled the number of data available. <laughs> every, every 15 months. So it's exponential. And the other one is we, we're working with uh, scientists at the Singularity University in, in uh, California. And one of them said in his book, he wrote a book about abundance, saying uh, the future is better than what you think. And he said that today, a Maasai warrior in Kenya has access to more data than the president of the United States 20 years ago. Mm. Mm. Don't know if it's good or bad, but um, <laughs> uh, it tells you that we are in, in a completely different world and that everybody has access. It's not a question of developed countries and developed countries. As long as I travel to India very often, it's amazing what uh, technology solution they, they developed. Um, and so for us, it's really about how can we make the world better through those technologies? So uh, building an intelligent society, because you get a lot of intelligence from data. So I, I don't want to go through other examples, but we're working, Fujitsu is working with JICA on some uh, smart agriculture uh, projects uh, where we try to deliver to farmers in every country. We have a project in Vietnam with uh, JICA. We have project in uh, Japan, of course, in Finland, where we use data and uh, data-driven uh, intelligence to help increase the yield uh, of the crops for, for farmers. And it's, it's uh, a macro challenge for the world. It's, you know, as the population grows, how do you need, we need to improve the productivity of food producing uh, to avoid uh, shortage. We are investing in smart cities. Um, you, you mentioned some of the example, but if you go to Tokyo, Tokyo is one of, I think it's the most populated city in the world. You rarely see a traffic jam. Mm. So it's not like New York. Mm -hmm. um, so there, we, we've developed with the other uh, technology companies some system for people to anticipate the, the flows and uh, you don't see traffic jams. We even develop with Microsoft a technology that we call, um, and it's not a joke, smart cows, to increase the fertility of cows by uh, leveraging data uh, on their, um, how much, because we, we found that the, the way they walk um, gives indication about their level of fertility. And so we take advantage of those data and same, increase the productivity for farmers. And so, Technology is, is changing the world. You probably see that in your daily life. Um, it's going to change more drastically. The, the same uh, singularity um, scientist, in, he wrote a book that I really recommend called The Driverless Car. Uh, and um, his name is Vivek Wadwa. And he, he, he explained where the technology is taking us. And he, he, he paints a, a, a good picture and a bad picture. And saying, if we're not uh, serious and we, if we don't put some governance, the world we are building with technology is Mad Max. If we are putting strong governance, it's going to be Star Trek. It's going to be a, a, a nice. So are we going to make Star Trek or are going to be Mad Max? Mm -hmm. And technology can bring us in both directions. And honestly, business cannot do that by himself. I don't think government and institution can do that by themselves. And so we, we really have to work together to drive technology for the good of society, because this is what's, what's happening is really powerful. So I, I don't know, I'm not sure I answer your question, but that was Thank my you. answer. Thank you. <laughs> Sean, thanks for being here. What is Cloudera? And uh, when I say the term big data and data mining, what does that mean for a company like Cloudera? Sure. Uh, thanks, Dan, for inviting me and fellow panelists. Uh, so, 
You know, I think early, uh, Cloudera recently uh, became a public corporation, and I think early on we talked about ourselves or the market talked about us as a big data company, or in some ways the big data company. And uh, today that uh, wording doesn't appear in our about section of our, of our website. And, and a big reason, probably the biggest reason is uh, governments and researchers and bankers and folks all around the world that use our technology, our open source technology, um, use it for a shared data experience is why they use it. And they use it to have a modern platform for machine learning and advanced analytics. So we think of ourselves for that reason. And you mentioned the, the six foot stack of, of paper, um, regardless of the mentality of the end users or the mission, we look at that as big data, and the subtype is unstructured. We, we would love to take a six-foot stack of unstructured data, which we would think of as big data, or a phone that's spitting real-time signals about how many folks are on a bus. While, you, while it may not fill up an Excel spreadsheet, the fact that it's real-time to us might mean, hey, this is, this is big data. So. Um, I appreciate, I always say in conferences that when I'm talking about cancer, you can do a lot of amazing things in cancer with small data. But increasingly, I think we give up uh, the terms big data and small data and talk more about uh, how much machine learning is there, how, how open source is it, how much open data is it, uh, and what can we do in this realm um, to make citizens' lives better, faster, in an objective, measurable way. What is open data? Just so everyone's on the same page. What does that mean? I, I'm sure there's as many definitions maybe as folks in the room, but ha, I would describe it as, uh, and there was, there's endless uh, dialogues about it, um, that, for example, in the US, if there's public funding for particular research, um, there may be mandates that that principal investigator or that research team makes the underlying data they used in that academic peer-reviewed data available for others at a very granular level, the raw data, um, so that <coughs> secondary, if you will, secondary research could be done on it and additional insights could be made on it. Um, I've seen a number of grants that mandate and require data to be made open um, ex post facto of whatever the research is. And so today, um, another one, uh, Steve Ballmer, the ex-CEO of, uh, of Microsoft, has USA Facts dot org, which is a, a way of making government data that is by nature open, more usable. USA so, vaccinations, like vax? Uh, USA facts. Facts. Dot org. Um, and so, so we're excited as an open source company that the more and more open data, and, and the reason, one of the reasons that I never predicted, but I've seen being out in the wild, and by that partly I mean universities all, all over the world is, um, there are data scientists by the hundreds, and these folks have compute, and they have access to cloud, and they're smart, and they're in every continent, and they're starving for data. And if you give them data, if we do a, you do a hackathon over a weekend, I, there's someone from Institute Pasteur that talks about doing a hackathon in Africa in a tent. And it's like, you know, we'll put the servers there, and if we give them a cube of data, they will become bioinformaticists. Um, and so we're very excited about open data as a concept. Of course, there are ethical issues, regulatory issues, et cetera. Folks like Claire need to think about how to, how to do all that, but we want to uh, empower that whenever possible. So, okay, so technical question. Is it gobs of data or bucketfuls of data? <laughs> Look, you said terabytes, so you're already in the water. I'm right? in the water, right in the water. You're certified. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but Sean, tell me about when you heard you heard the conversation earlier about the SDGs and uh, the data revolution. And could you just? I, I think it would be useful because um, you represent one of these tech companies that helps think just as Fujitsu. Could you just share a little bit about your thinking about about this? Because I think I think a lot of organizations when they see a tech company they see dollar signs. So should should somebody somebody, somebody say hey? What I really want from you is a lot of money. Is that what a com if someone says I want to work with you on solving the quote unquote solving the SDGs or achieving the data revolution for development? What is what is a company like Cloudera able to provide? Sure, and it, it's funny you say that because uh, 
you know, I can very quickly understand where someone's coming from when they come up to me and they either think of me as someone who can, who's, because we're in the private sector, we have money to sponsor their next event. So, so they just I want have to a know about of a that. hackathon with food trucks. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so yes, I say yes. We will, we will support that. And then there are folks who come and realize, wow, th this guy every single day is talking to the largest health systems in the world, the largest cities. This person is very connected. They've seen what works and what doesn't work. And so obviously, selfishly, that makes us uh, feel better as stakeholders. But um, you know, an interesting one is the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative recently started a project called the Human Cell Atlas, which in some ways could be as big or will likely be as big as the Human Genome Project. Um, and they had something like 100 researchers, and they invited three uh, technology companies. And they, just like Claire you know, t talked about this with me, folks that are really on the inside say, hey, there are a few people out there who are willing to go and get executive sponsorship and get money and more important, get networking. And a lot of what I do ends up being just that. And I think this was touched on in terms of these subnational regions, regional agencies. And by the way, you need f folks like, like Paul from what I've heard who's very focused on, hey, let's get, a let's get a target, let's meet that target, let's actually achieve something that isn't about talking. Um, but putting people together. So I have friends at NIH who say, hey, how do we keep the H3 genomic initiatives going in Africa? I have, I have software I can bring to the table, but more important than the software I bring to the table is that I have connections to the universities in Africa. We can help those folks get uh, the NIH funding down to Africa. And then the, the most, one of the most important parts uh, is overlaying that with a rubric of responsible people who create synergies like you do, or Catalyst and Claire and other folks that I don't get to live in that world, um, but are amazing in the funding organization, the NGOs, et cetera. Um, so I, I apologize for, for, um, for rambling in that, but I would say if folks in the audience um, <coughs> maybe think a little bit more, more broadly about technology companies um, and I, one of the things that I like about technology companies as well is very often the founding fathers of the technology companies have been um, monetized in some way and have to think about their future. They would their love legacy. to be embraced and brought into the community that, that you guys do because um, it's not always offered to them. Yeah, I actually think I very mm -hmm. rarely see that, you know, I think the, so I don't know if it's a bias, I'd say the West Coast tech people um, I can use that. I'm sure there's a better term than that. Um, we rarely call them or, you know, it's a long, it's, I'd rather go to London than go to San Francisco. I mean, so if you're a Washington person, if you're a Washington policy person, I'd rather get on a plane and go to London or Germany than I'd go to San Francisco. That's a little provincial, but I think that's a true statement. <laughs> so I think you're right, Sean. I think, could I just, let me just press you just a little bit further since I have you here. So. Let's operate as if, if someone wants to engage a tech company, it's not about would you please sponsor my next hackathon, and it's about how do I leverage your technology or your networks. Could we just, could you just ideate here with me for a second about, okay, how if I'm Claire Melamed or I'm Paul Zeitz at the State Department or I'm at JICA or the Asian Development Bank, and I really don't know much about exactly what you guys have some black box somewhere, and I don't really, I kind of, I'm a smart person, but I kind of don't really know whether the hell it's terabytes or buckets full of data or any of that kind of stuff. How can they play with you? How do they, how should they, how should, how should someone have a partnership with Cloudera? Well, I think um, you mentioned Claire, and I, my suspicion is that, that we're remiss at not already being in the the partnership, um, You're and there, <laughs> there are right. probably many others that are, are more sophisticated than we are. Um, but I would say that uh, just as, and I know exactly what you mean about, about going out west, imagine um, the perspective from that side of the street. They don't want to come out here. Um, well, but, but, but wondering where, where are you all, and why am I meeting you all in Mumbai and London and not on my home turf? And I think it's just an outreach like any other outreach. And I think that they all have causes, but it's more about being part of a community. And I don't want to say folks haven't been invited, but they haven't been invited in a structured way that they understand. Now, here's what, what I would say. Every single commercial organization in big tech, or whatever you want to call it, 
They're working on the same issues as every other organization. Diversity, how do we get involved? Simon Sinek, the Golden Circle guy, talks about millennials wanting to do something that feels meaningful. You, you all have this amazing asset. You're hooked in and plugged in like they can't be and are not into something that matters. So if you go to them and say, we have a way to make your millennials work on code, but one day a week or one day a one month engage with something that matters, they'll say, yes, how much? That, mm. That's it. And because they're not being given those opportunities. Maybe that's the wrong way no, to I'm say it. No, I'm buying that. That's yeah. exactly, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You earned your cookie at the <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, Paul, thanks for being here. So you're the former director of the Data Revolution for Sustainable Development at the Star State. You were there for three years at the State Department. Um, so when I think about Paul Zeitz, I think about someone who toiled in the vineyards, who toiled in the vineyards on data. So can you talk a little bit about what your past life was and that, in terms of what you were doing? Can you talk about where is the United States in terms of data? And could you reflect a little bit on the conversations that's been happening here? Because I'd say if I think about a Washington personality who's been thinking about development and data, there's a handful of them, and one of them would be you. So I'm really glad you're here. So, Thank you, Dan. Thanks uh, for including me. And congrats to uh, CSIS and JICA for You publishing. did read the report, right? I did read it m more than one time. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> Over fabulous. the past couple of months, a few Fabulous, times. fabulous. Um, it's a strong report, and um, I am really excited that CSIS is publishing a report with, a, with actually a perfect title, Harnessing the Data Revolution to Achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. And the content is real and, and meaningful, so I think it's really important. I hope that Mass Avenue and other think tanks will follow suit and start taking a deep dive into this really extraordinary topic. I don't know if the slides are up, um, can, Charles. Can we get the slides the first up? Slide. The slides? Uh, uh, yeah. No? Okay. Clicker, clicker. No, clicker. Clicker. So, uh, forward. Can you see forward on there? I hope we can achieve a data revolution <laughs> okay, that help with so the I, slides. This is a slide that I'd like to start off with, and I think it's still relevant for this presentation. Mm -hmm. I, I like to say the data revolution is like the matrix. We cannot know what it is, but can we harness it? I mean, we've already heard from our colleagues about the rapid pace of data production and the rapid uh, state of innovations. I think uh, everywhere I go, in uh, develop, the developing world and actually throughout the US government, everyone is trying to figure this out. Um, we can say that the military and intelligence communities are furthest ahead. And we can say the private sector is really far advanced. I would say our sustainable development community, our, our, our sustainable development movement that we're all part of, we're at least 10 to 15 years behind. We're mm -hmm. like tadpoles. I know you want to leapfrog, but I think we're tadpoles swimming in circles still. Um, how did you do that? <laughs> Sorry. Next slide. Just even this whole, like the whole slide thing, it's like a, yeah, it's like a metaphor. I, there's, mm -hmm. there's no forward. Just, just okay. yeah, what you so, I mean, in the US government, um, I went into the government during the fourth quarter of the Obama administration, and they were preparing to negotiate for the Sustainable Development Agreement and the Paris Climate Treaty. And uh, there was a lot of discussion about what, how does the government respond to these commitments that we were making. Uh, around these very important um, agendas. And so we um, were able to uh, mobilize a political commitment from the Obama uh, White House to advance uh, data revolution for sustainable development. And we recognized that there were assets and equities across the US government that were unconnected, siloed, uncoordinated, and uh, uh, just not even connecting at all. And so, uh, there were things going on in state, in USAID, in EPA, in Department of Agriculture, in the Census Bureau. I mean, on and on and on it goes. There are assets and equities that relate to achieving sustainable development in the United States and around the world. And so there is, I would say, we're still in an early stage of even understanding the vastness of what's possible and, uh, and then applying it towards achieving sustainable development. Um, I'm proud that uh, the U.S. government was the first country to report its baseline data last year, September in 2016. We reported our, 20, our 2015 baseline. It's incomplete. We can't report on all the goals. We have data gaps. We have data challenges. 
And now, uh, you know, a year later, there's about uh, maybe a half a dozen countries that have started to report their baseline data. Um, I, you know, we're two years into this 15-year political commitment around sustainable development goals, and only a handful of countries are reporting their baseline data. I think that's a huge gap, in my view. Um, in the U.S., it, what is exciting, and we have Cynthia here from Bread, there's a U.S. domestic SDG coalition that's pretty vibrant. And there are cities like New York, Baltimore, San Jose, California. I just learned Washington, D.C. is now picking up the steam. And others that are really trying to adapt the goals for local implication. So to your point about what companies can do, like the SDGs aren't being achieved anywhere. We have poverty everywhere. We're not getting everyone in school. People aren't getting health care. I mean, on and on. A data-driven response to our challenges here at home and globally is a critical opportunity, I would say. So get local. Bring your capacities to solving problems wherever your company's based. I'm sure you know, they are not achieving the sustainable development goals in most of those places. Um, I think that uh, you know, we, uh, we, I would say that the, there's a huge opportunity for JICA with the announcement of the new SDG information initiative uh, throughout the government of Japan to look at the prefecture, the subnational level, and how can those levels be involved in demonstrating applications for the data revolution. If you can bring that Tokyo traffic thing to Washington or Nairobi, we would all welcome it. You'd be very mm -hmm. grateful. Yeah, extremely grateful. So uh, scaling and replicating those things. Um, this slide, I mean, we talked about, I think the challenge that I am um, I'm, I'm struggling with right now is that in the government, there are huge bureaucracies. We have uh, hundreds of statistical agencies and programs. There's you know, more than terabytes of data that are being used. Administrative, financial data, statistical data, program and survey data, and uh, large, large assets and eff efforts underway with geospatial and earth observation data, at, and applying it to sustainable development, but it is a cacophony. It is like all over the map. It's a jungle out there. And uh, we need to figure out how to transition from a cacophony of data into a symphony of data. And I think in the symphony, we have to bring in the private sector big data. We have to leverage it and harness it. There's so much possibility there. And as everyone said, the smartphones. We've only had these smartphones for 10 years. We're still at the very, very beginning of this kind of digital data revolution. How do we connect all the kinds of data? How do we make them interoperable? And Claire is leading a working group with the UN on making data interoperability uh, a top priority and developing an agenda around that. And that's a challenge for our company colleagues. How do you help us achieve interoperability so we can achieve the SDGs? I think we need all hands on deck to solve that problem. People are, you know, very few people in the SDG space that I've seen are actually systematically and at scale applying predictive analytics or artificial intelligence. There's a blockchain craze that's coming, that's hit Washington uh, this, this year. It's like a tsunami of interest around blockchain. Um, it's not being applied to sustainable development yet at all. Uh, maybe some pilots are happening. But it, we're really primitive in the sustainable development movement. And um, I hope that this report and all the work that uh, Claire's doing in mobilizing stakeholders, we have to make the way forward concrete and tangible, though. You know, we talk about the capacity gap. Well, in my world, in the global health world, you know, it's not just about capacity development for capacity's sake. It's because you want to save lives or you want to get something done in the world. And so the SDGs offer us an opportunity to set time-bound, measurable goals and targets, <coughs> mobilize all stakeholders to say what they want to get done by 2020, say. Um, you know, we have 30 months till December 31st, 2020. Let's, no one is talking about what we're all going to do together to get something measurably done by the end of uh, 2020 as an interim step towards 2025 and towards 2030. So I'm actually uh, wanting to ask all of you, how do we take all the uh, goodwill and political interest and technological and operational capability, and how do we connect everyone into a symphony of action 
towards measurable time-bound goals and targets for 2020. Like, let's just do it for December 30th, 2020. Great. Let me get, I'd like to call on one or two folks from the audience who have been very patient. I'd welcome a couple of comments from the audience. If not, I'm going to happily, uh, uh, I've got a couple questions for this group. This woman here and this woman here, two of you. My name is Jerry Hush. I'm a sociologist who has worked for over 30 years in the UN system and who actually has been dealing with this issue all the way from the MDGs, now currently uh, transformed into the SDGs. And I'd like to thank everybody on the panel because you're bringing to the audience issues that myself and hidden, I'll call us the hidden others, <laughs> we're the ones trying to deal with this. Um, I was the UNDP accountability specialist. I worked for UNICEF as the accountability specialist. I worked for WHO and FAO. I understand data. How do we make sense out of it? And what I'd like to hear, because I personally think, and I actually know, having worked a little bit with Paul, I think that there are solutions that are being discussed about how can we move from a cacophony to a symphony. And one of the frustrations I know my team feels, and this was a team that was built, actually I would like to thank JICA because we were with the a Africa Adaptation Program, which was JICA funded, huge project in over 13 nations in Africa, and we worked in six of those to bring together data across various ministries so that we could address highly complex issues. So I think I would like to hear how are you in the panel recognizing people like me <laughs> in the laboratory and how can we better contribute what we're doing and little pieces and raising hands. How is there perhaps time for um, a meeting where those of us who have been struggling and seeking to come up with what I call a data standard, the ability to work with complex social system data with a single way of making sense. So I'd like to hear some um, solutions to where we are. Let me just get this other question, then I'll ask the panelists to respond. Hi, thank you all. My name is Dana Walter, and I'm a public health and telecommunications professional. One of the, um, I formerly worked at a Fortune 500 company, so I well understand also the, the differences between the public and private sectors. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you all for hosting and for the panelists for, for sharing your knowledge. Um, with the experience I have now, one thing that I've noticed in this conversation and having looked at the report, and perhaps I missed it in the report, but I would have a conversation for you all, particularly for Cloudera and Jiu-Jitsu, and I believe the State Department, Paul, you just mentioned blockchain. Um, the question of security and what do we do to secure the data that we're trying to um, capture in developing countries as we're training folks in developing nations to um, improve their lives. I particularly was interested in the, the bus example in Laos and how immediately came to mind an idea of, you know, well, this data could be hijacked. The next thing we know, the buses could be used for, you know, different means than we would like, right? Public transportation gone bad. Um, so I just wanted to put this out there, food for thought. Um, and I know we, we can't have this conversation um, completely. It may be another, you know, link, but I know definitely in the private sector, particularly in tech companies, security comes in the same breath as data. Data and security are one, and in fact, security is one, data is number two. So I would ask and challenge all of us in this room mm. and the panelists what we're doing to secure data in developing countries and in the U.S. as we proceed forward. Thank you. Thank you. Two great questions. Thank you. Can I, Claire, can I ask you to go? We'll just go down the row here, but I, Claire, give you... Sure. I mean, I think um, just to start with, with Jerry's point about bringing in the insights from academia and from the, um, the, the kind of all of the great work that you and others have been doing over many years. I mean, I think this is really, for me, this is the same question as we've implicitly been discussing on the panel of, you know, the, the challenge involved in bringing together different types of organization, different types of people with different ways of communicating, different incentives, different histories, you know, different sort of employment histories and different understandings of what is the important question and different time frames, you know, you, you name it, everything is different. And I think just as it's not always easy to set up a constructive dialogue between a government and a private sector organization, because often they're facing very different incentives and very different understanding of the nature of the problem, the same is often true also of academia. And I think it's just a question of us all 
being able to frame the question and the way that we have the conversation in ways that is going to work for the different types of organizations that need to be in the room. It's a challenge. You know, I sometimes think this whole question about the SDGs and partnership, you know, we throw around this word partnership and partnership and partnership, and it's, you know, we're all talking about it all the time. But we kind of act as if it's really easy. But if it's really easy, then there wouldn't be a need for a global partnership because we'd be doing it already because it's so obviously important. So I kind of think what we need to do is find the most difficult partnerships because those are the ones where an organization like mine can most add value because those are the ones that wouldn't be happening anyway. So I kind of think if it wasn't difficult, then we wouldn't be having to do it. That's not quite an answer to your question, but I think your question is actually the same. You're bringing a different constituency into the same conversation that we've, um, that we've been having, and, and importantly so. And I think sometimes it's hard for, you know, I, in my previous job, I worked at a, um, a think tank in the UK. In fact, there's a former colleague here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not always easy to get heard as an academic. You don't have the same, people don't need to listen to you in the same way as they need to listen to a big company or a government representative. But, you know, I think it's, the onus is on all of us to bring the best information that we have to solve the problem. That's the first one. The security question, I mean, I think, you know, there is no, again, this is a question to which there is no easy answer because if it is not such an obviously important question that if it was, we'd already have solved it. I think I would say a number of things. I think, firstly, on the tech side, there are lots of different ways that people are trying to answer that question. One of the interesting ones, I think, is, you know, we're assuming that in terms of at least releasing data for public use, what you need to do is get the data out of the company. There are some very interesting experiments going on, which, you know, some of which our organizations um, within the global partnership are involved in and others, which is about taking the question into the data. So you don't need, you know, if you want to access the data from Fujitsu or from, a, you know, another company, you don't need them to give you your data. <coughs> what you need is for you to put your question inside their firewall. And then you get the, you don't actually want the data. What you want is the answer, that the, the insight that the data can give you. So there is a lot of, t at the technical level, there are lots of questions. So that, we shouldn't only look to the answers at the technical level. This is a highly political question. And we need to, um, you know, a big answer to this is going to be at the political level, the kinds of regulations um, and the <coughs> kinds of frameworks that will give companies and everybody else and, and individuals the security, the confidence to feel like this is, um, that this is, you know, that they will trust that the, their data will be used properly and well. Um, and then I think, you know, there's also, of course, a social dimension. You know, my children worry a lot less about security than I do because they've just grown up in that world. They don't, you know, they've lived, they grew up with, well, it's not even Facebook anymore, it's Instagram and, you know, whatever else. And they, they for them, the definition of this question is very different. So I think we'll see a sort of evolution of our social norms around security as well in ways that because that's not my generation, I, don't, I can't really predict where that's going to go. But I think there's a framing thing that just finally, Dan, that I would like to suggest here, which is you have to look at this on both sides. We tend to, you know, we, we, on questions of security, we adapt, we tend to think in terms of a sort of very extreme version of the precautionary principle. You know, if I can't guarantee my security, I don't want to have anything to do with this. But there are all kinds of things that, as a result, we're not going to do. There are all kinds of insights and ways of improving the world for people that we're going to sacrifice if the absolute primary concern is to guard against any possible hypothetical um, security damage breach. to people's privacy. And I'm not belittling the challenge of security. I think people are right to be concerned about it. And the more we depend on technology, you know, the example of driverless cars and things, the more right we are to be concerned about it. But if we prioritize security above all else, there is an opportunity cost to that. And I think we also need to understand both sides of that equation. Thank you. Kanya? Mr. Mr. Kanya? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to comment on the two questions? It's a, you can pass if you want to, or, or just take one. Before, before this presentation, I could talk. Use the microphone. Before this presentation and a seminar, I took this car. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, we have, and also before this uh, seminar, Hano, she suggested regional cooperation is important. And uh, to we, uh, actually, sorry, I, I, I didn't know. Your project. 
but uh, the, in all over the world, we have many projects, and we think that the regional cooperation is very important. For example, in Africa, uh, we cooperated uh, SDG Center for Africa, and we gathered many information, including data on innovations, and we share uh, such kind of many attempts on the trial and the error. And uh, uh, I think you know, we should share you know, uh, such kind of good examples, and, uh, 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 and we should take, go forward. Great. Thanks so much, Mr. Tom. Mr. Tom. Yeah. <clears throat> Two very quick points on, on your first question uh, and the point about bringing uh, private sector and public sector together. You'll be surprised by the change even within the public sector of the way we work with customers. The world is becoming so complex. We don't sell on the shelf solution anymore. So we have the type of request you have. We can absolutely develop the same co-creation type of approach with the public sector because this is the way now we work with our customer. The, the, there is no pre-packaged solution to the problem they are trying to solve because it's becoming so complex. You know, we have banks coming to us saying, blockchain is going to destroy my business. How do I solve uh, in the next three or four years? How do I solve this problem and redefine who we are as a business? This is exactly the same type of discussion we can have with the public sector on SDG uh, initiative. And you will be surprised by how much public, uh, private sector company are ready to invest and work with you on that. So shame on both of us for not connecting the dots because at Fujitsu at least, the way we are managed, we're managed on four items and financial results is only the third one. First one is con uh, customers, second one is people, financials, and what we call responsible business. And so, I don't know if we can solve the symphony, mm -hmm. but, because it, it's too complicated, but my recommendation is let's take some project like we do with JICRA, JICA, and in, we are ready to invest. We're ready, it's, it's one of our core uh, management item to be responsible. We know if the world is not uh, improving, Fujitsu is not going to improve with it. So that's, that's a very important point, and it's very aligned to what we see with private sector customers. The, the complexity of what's going on is so uh, big that uh, we, have to, we are building solution one case at a time. So that's my recommendation. Cybersecurity, we're probably going to need another four hours, because mm -hmm. um, even if our children, my daughter the same, she doesn't care, but once it's going to touch her money and her else. Uh, data, she's going to care about privacy. This is a, a, a tremendous topic. This is where we need the government to align around the world on some cybersecurity global agreement. Otherwise, the digital world won't happen. So it's really, it's really a critical topic because it goes beyond sharing pictures and sharing. Uh, it will go, you know, blockchain is going to transform the way you, we, we manage transaction and we better have a, a safe, secure environment or it's going to be main end. Mm. Sean. Yeah, um, thanks for the questions. I think for us, and I'm glad you asked it, and it's good to ask the tough questions. Security is important to us. And uh, you know, even though the word cloud is in our name, my portfolio is health and life science, and probably three quarters of our customers uh, choose to keep their data on premise as part of their data lake just because there are some, um, let's say, exigent advantages to, uh, to keeping it there. And um, I was reminded in what Claire said, I'm involved in a global collaborative, um, which is OHDSI, Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics, or Odyssey, which has that federated approach. And every institution in the collaborative keeps their data right right on site, and what is transferred is, uh, is the question. Mm -hmm. And every, everyone keeps their data in the same model, uh, which ensures that when some researcher asks a question, uh, they can send that question out, and you run it on your own data, and you send the results back, and it's up to the principal investigator to, 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 aggregate, uh, to aggregate those results. And, um, and it's an open source community, and, and it works. And uh, it would show probably extreme naivete for me to ask the question of, could there be some sustainable development goal that has an open source 
data model of water quality that every com country implements on premise and spatial epidemiologists or, or sophisticated data scientists that work for Paul or our Paul create a query and then just send it out to the countries and all the data comes back to Davos or Brussels or wherever you guys call home. Um, I, you know, we, I, I like the on-prem model due to familiarity and, and uh, because it also um, feels comfortable for folks security-wise for whatever reason. Um, and we see huge um, advantages in, in many organizations that feel super comfortable and more comfortable uh, in one cloud or even more so, so that one cloud vendor isn't uh, too big to fail, um, having multiple cloud uh, storage vendors. But, but yeah, federating the questions out to data in place seems appealing to me. Hey, Paul. I, uh, thank you. Um, just uh, on Jerry's question about like how do we build on what we've already done, I mean, I'm going to take the, uh, re the response in terms of uh, how do we fill the financing gap that you outlined in your report, hundreds of millions of dollars of a financing gap uh, for the data revolution for sustainable development. I personally think that's a very lowball estimate of actually what is needed, um, but at least it's there. Um, so, I mean, I think that we need to figure out a way, and you know, we've done this in other sectors, in health and climate and others, where partners work together and pool resources and go to the next level. And so, I think there's opportunities uh, with Japan and the UK and the World Bank and other uh, donors coming together uh, to really try to uh, pool resources and really accelerate the investment in these innovations and building on all the, the track record from you and many other people that's getting lost in the shuffle almost. We're like, we're stuck in this pilot mode. So we need an architectural fix, I believe. Um, on the privacy and security question, I think it's, I think Claire answered it better than I can. I mean, I think there, the rules of the game are still being created. And um, I, I'm not sure, you know, I've been in discussions where people say we need a global cybersecurity kind of norms or, or rules of the game. I, I'm not opposed to that personally, but um, what I see happening is that governments around the world are, are figuring it out. I know in Africa, there are governments that are developing these rules now about how private sector can even run algorithms on their data and make data products available for public good. My response is similar to Claire's um, in that these global goals are the first time ever in human history that we have uh, brought together time-bound measurable goals and targets to advance and achieve uh, social, economic, and environmental justice. And so if we believe as people on the planet at this time that we are living in that moment where we're it, we're the ones that we've been waiting for, and we're the ones that has to actually get our act together into a symphony of coordinated action, then let's write the rules of the game where we're actually trying to achieve the SDGs. If it's just about like, you know, privacy and security versus open data, it's a very technical, and I've been in years of those discussions, they're very circular and they never get you anywhere. So if we change the dialogue and say, we as a species living now on Earth, we want to achieve social, economic, and environmental justice because we see the threats to our existence and to the planet. And so we have, to, we have to start there. And then let's develop the rules of the game from that perspective. And you know, I, I think Claire's leading a lot of that work and we need to go further and faster. Um, it's two years into this 15 year agenda. We only have 13 years mm. to reach the unreachable. So folks, like we have to wake up and start doing stuff differently and better. New institutions, new platforms, new financing approaches. Uh, we can't do micro, small scale modifications of what is happening if we're ever going to have any chance to get there. Paul, thank you very much. On that note, we're going to end it. Thank you very, very much. Thank, please, Chairman, and thank you for coming.